Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In 1963, I was coming of age for the NOM draft, and in my mind, there was no question that I would be drafted. It would be only a matter of time. So I decided to dodge the draft and head for the West Coast. Many people in my family were saddened by my decision, but I would not be swayed. The bottom line was that this fight was not about battling someone with desires of world domination. Rather, it was a spitting match and a moneymaker for those who didn't have the guts to fight themselves. As I left, I thought that I could get lost in a crowd as well as anyone else, and the West Coast was as far away as I could get without leaving the country entirely. So, I was willing to take a shot. It wasn't long after I first hit the coast that I found myself hanging with the street hippies and flower children. These people were wandering aimlessly through life, and for the most part, they were doped out of their minds, both day and night, being the rebellious anti-war crowd which dominated California at the time. Soon after I arrived, I found myself hooking up with a guy named Jimmy Brines. Like me, he was on the run having a dive room in a flop house, and his philosophy was work cheap and work for cash. This way, people will be so happy to have you that they wouldn't dare think you out. The second part of his philosophy was to keep moving, and so he did. We were now a team. Thumbing rides was much too risky, so it adopted the practice of jumping rail cars from location to location, and I'd officially become a hobo. It was an extremely dangerous racket, Sometimes we would check the doors on freight cars at night, hoping to find one that we could sneak into, while at other times we would cling between two cars for hours at a time. As the train ran down the track, occasionally we could even make our way to the roof and hold on for dear life. God help you if you had to go to the bathroom or got sick. In those days, the tracks were littered with many of those who fell to their death under the cars, doing exactly what we were doing. There was always the threat of being seen and having the cops flag the train down, but we were willing to take the risk. We soon found out that there was a network of camps running up and down the state. Thousands of guys like us created these god-forsaken ghettos in the woods out of trash, scrap wood, and sheet metal. It was hell, and I was starting to wonder if I should give it up altogether. In the second camp that we hit, one of the drunks told us to make sure that we sleep close together. We looked at each other for a moment, and I know that we both thought the same thing. When I questioned him about his motivation, he told me that guys disappear from this place at night, especially when the farming season was over. This dude staggered off, and the two of us realized that you could lose your life in these woods for a $5 bill, and no one would ever know the difference. We stayed awake that entire night. The next day, I caught up with the same cat from the night before, and this time he was relatively sober, so I asked him about the guys disappearing. He looked me square in the eyes and said that the hairy men took bums like us for food. I shook my head in disbelief and asked him what the heck a hairy man was, and he told me there were things in these woods that man knows nothing about. When the food runs low out in the fields, they come to us looking for a meal. This was the craziest thing that I'd ever heard, hairy men eating humans. All I could think of was that this guy had to be touched in the brain. 
That afternoon, we split yet again. There was no way we were going to hang here for another night. We slept in the woods by a freight yard for two days, hoping to find an open car, and finally we did. Being a hobo was a lot like being an addict. If people dug you, they would take you in and hook you up with what you needed to know. You became part of the in crowd. So on our next jump off, we found another camp and got hooked into a little work as well. We worked at a masonry yard for several weeks, crashing inside of some cesspool rings at night. The owner knew it, but he didn't care. We were giving him a good day's work on the cheap, and he knew we were runners. He had a portable toilet in the yard and let us use his sink during the day. In keeping with our philosophy of always moving on, we split the scene after about 12 days and went back to the camp. When we got back, a number of the guys said to watch our butts because one of the guys was taken in his sleep the week before. When we asked what he had been taken by, they told us that one of the big hairy suckers had gotten him, pulling him right out of his box, screaming and kicking into the woods. All of his stuff was still in the camp, and no hobo would ever leave his stuff anywhere. That was the end for me. I hung in the camp for a few more hours while a couple of these guys talked about a boneyard they had found a few miles north that had human remains scattered everywhere. An hour later, I was on the highway, thumbing a ride, and I didn't care if I got caught or even arrested. I was done with this whole scene, man. It took me almost two months to get home, stopping to work for some food and lodging along the way. When I got home, my draft number hadn't even come up. However, it did not too long after that, at which point I had a change of heart and went into service. Thankfully, I had a good working knowledge of engines, which parlayed me into a stateside gig, and I'm obviously alive and here today to tell my tale. On to the next one. Every one of my relatives has a long history of enjoying the outdoors through hunting. Early in the morning, my dad and I set out on a hunting trip. We figured that if we went ahead of the other hunters, we would have a greater chance of sighting grouse. We deviated onto an abandoned locking road with a split in it. We first followed the path that split off to the right. Unfortunately, we were unable to harvest any grouse despite seeing numerous. Along that same old logging road, we had seen two other hunters who had chosen the left fork earlier in the day. The two experienced hunters we spoke with were short. My dad and I didn't begin traveling down the left fork until 11 o'clock that morning. Also, we came to a halt. Ahead of us, on the side of the road, stood a big figure like a man. He faced us squarely, over the left shoulder as he stood at an angle. But this wasn't a human being. All of the things were covered with hair that was a drab gray-black color. Most people would probably say it's a half-ape, half-human. They were approximately seven feet in height would be my educated guess for their size. We couldn't tell what sex or eye color the man-like creatures had. We could only guess but the other details were crystal clear. We cautiously began to retreat. This humanoid creature slowly retreated into the bushes, turning around before taking two hefty steps. We were both shocked. My dad was 56 and I was just 17. My father had spent most of his life in the outdoors hunting. Given that this was his first encounter, you can understand his shock. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It may not matter, but until this, I had never considered Bigfoot to be a real creature. The experience convinced my father and me that there really was a humanoid creature lurking in our woods. On to the next one.
in Lane County in Oregon. I was staying the summer with an older cousin and his wife. I was 13 or 14 at the time. They lived in the mountains, somewhere out of Elmira. My cousin and his wife were new to Oregon. They had recently moved there from Bakersfield, California. My cousin was wanting to do some scouting as deer season was soon coming up. So one morning, we packed a lunch and headed out into the forest from his house. In this area, there was only one paved road. And in the direction we headed, there was only one dirt road that soon ended. There was a fairly good hiking trail that we traveled on for maybe an hour and a half. Then we came upon a smaller, less traveled path that we stayed on for a good 45 minutes. Stopping now and again on the edge of small clearings, the forest became too thick to see very far at all. So we decided to try and make our way up onto the side of the mountain we had been traveling at the base of. After about 30 to 40 minutes of dead-end game trail, we had gotten high enough that the forest started to thin a bit. We came to a small clearing that gave us a slight view of the valley below. We decided that we had gone far enough and decided to stop there and eat before turning back. It wasn't but just a moment after getting our food out and sitting back on an old log that we heard some rustling and snapping of twigs, what seemed like just out of our sight in the dense forest. But the sound of the twigs, we both knew this, couldn't be a rabbit or any small animal. My cousin instantly turned and whispered, Bear. We were still for about one minute. Then came identical noises from the opposite side of the clearing. This really confused me, as the sounds were rather loud, and I didn't see how it could have moved to the other side of the clearing without us hearing it. My cousin then whispered, Two bears, and then whispered, They smell the food. Just then, there was a loud snap in the area of the second noise. Another of the things that was most frightening was the loudness of the cracking. I thought, this is one huge bear. Over the next two minutes, I was terrified as the snapping and breaking of what must have been large branches changed position. Around the clearing, never did the noise come simultaneously from the same spot. Not until I heard the shot did I see my cousin with a snub nose 38 pointed into the air. As soon as he fired, there came a loud, powerful roar that started low in pitch and ended very high, not shrill. It was a warning I will never forget. As soon as this powerful yell, scream, bellow ended, we were on our feet and running in the direction we had come from. After about 50 yards to our horror, there came another yell, and I was sure this thing was following us. We began running at full speed. I instantly started getting scratched and struck by the thick forest. We were running downhill, and at about 150 to 200 yards, it again screamed. It seemed so close, but we never saw anything. No movement, shadow, shape, nothing. We were now running as fast as we possibly could, not on path. I can only describe it as reckless abandon. Several times, I lost my feet and rolled and dove through ferns, trees, and thorny bushes. I became separated from my cousin, but never slowed up as this scream would repeat approximately every 20 seconds. Once back on the trail, my cousin emerged about 50 feet from me. We still ran for what must have been a mile before this thing let up and started giving us some distance. But every time we started to stop or even slow, it would yell as if to say, not yet, get going. It was the tiredest I'd ever been. My lungs and throat were past hurting. I was so tired, I was dizzy. 
I felt as if I would pass out any moment. We made it back to the house where his wife waited at the door, having heard the shots and the scream. I was ripped to shreds from the forest. My cousin refused to believe it was something like Bigfoot, although he knew it was no bear. He thought it was some pissed off crazy mountain man. I knew there wasn't a man alive that could have kept up with us, let alone make that noise. I only went outside two more times in the next week I was there. Once to go to the library and then to the train home. We went to the library to research what this could have been. My cousin said it was a panther, but I don't think he actually believed it. He wouldn't let me talk to anyone about it. The scream gave me the feeling that I was in a place I was not supposed to be and that I better leave and never come back. I've never been back to this area. This occurred in the early afternoon. The weather was warm for the area and I remember that there had not been as much rain as normal, but I recall it was hazy and the area of the clearing was kind of in a shadow from the mountain. It was very thick forest on the side of a mountain. On to the next one. This was in Yamhill County. Two friends and I were up in the hills northwest of Yamhill late in the evening, around 10.30 p.m. We heard the scream, a very low, very long howl. Not coyote, bear, or cougar. We have heard all of them before. This was nothing like anything I've ever heard. I still remember thinking to myself, how in the heck can something make such a low howl? It scared us at first, but it sounded like it was far away, like maybe a mile or so. We were drinking a little beer, so after a while, we relaxed and forgot about it. It must have been about a half an hour later when we heard it again. I swear that it had to be within 30 yards of us. The same howl, low howl, but much closer. And it sounded pissed. I could feel the sound vibrations bouncing off the back of my neck. The hair stood up on the back of all of our necks. All of us turned white as heck and our jaws dropped past our knees. The howl seemed to say, get out, which is exactly what we did. I just looked out at the other two guys and said, let's get the bleep out of here. We did not see anything, but felt the presence. I grew up within 10 miles of that spot. I had never heard that sound before or since, except on a television show that had a report of a Bigfoot sighting. A guy in Idaho caught one on video at least it looked like one, but when I saw the video, I heard that scream again. The guy talking in the video threw the camera in a ditch and hid. It was the same scream. The only other time I have ever heard it. It was exactly the same scream. I don't know exactly what it was that we heard, but I know what I think it was. A Bigfoot. That is my story and I have two witnesses to back me up. It took me a full five years to be able to go back up there while it was dark. It still kind of freaks me out when I think about it. There were two other witnesses other than me, both men who I grew up with and attended school with. It was on a gravel logging road, very dense fir forest, BLM land, Coast Range Mountain, altitude, 700 to 1,000 foot, unable to describe landmarks as it was dark. On to the next one. In Lincoln County in Oregon, a man and his now ex-wife were riding their Vespa scooter between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. and coasting downhill with the motor off, so there was no noise they noticed a movement about 100 yards downhill and saw a large brown creature get up off the ground, look at them, 
and start walking down the hill along the tree line. It had a flat face and a flat chest and swung its arms as it walked. It appeared to have a mane of hair around its head. It had left the area in the dry grass where it appeared to have been napping. On to the next one. In Pittsylvania County in Virginia, a friend and I were in the woods after nightfall in the fall. It was an old abandoned road. The city never paved and it was grown over very badly. It had been used as a party spot for teens for many years. I was against being there, but my friend wanted to pick up the beer cans for the money. You remember back when everyone was doing that? Anyway, as we walked down, I was shining the light from side to side, looking for anything or anyone that might be down there with us. You see, for about two years straight, we had run into with this thing on several occasions. All our parents told us we were crazy. It was probably someone in a suit trying to scare us. We know the difference in a suit and a real creature. Well, as I shined the light to the left and came back across the road, this thing took one step to its left and was out in the middle of the trail. That was about six feet in one step. This SOB was right in front of my light, about ten feet away. I had never been that close to it before. I was absolutely terrified and yelled at my buddy and turned and started running my you-know-what off. It wasn't really that tall, maybe between six and seven feet. It just stood there for the couple of seconds I looked at it. It never made a move towards us, just stood there and looked. I actually only saw it for a couple of seconds, but it was about four feet wide at the shoulders and dark colored. There were other encounters through the years. On to the next one. In Augusta County in Virginia, seven electrical power employees driving across an open pasture on their way to repair a power line noticed a tall, hairy Bigfoot-type creature standing in the middle of the field. The creature suddenly dashed to the edge of the nearby woods. It appeared to glide instead of run and briefly stopped to look at the men, and they noticed that it carried something to its chest resembling a red flashlight. It then disappeared into the woods. On to the next one. In Fairfax County in Virginia, I was assigned to Davidson as a military policeman. The airfield is not that large, and I'm pretty sure it's still an active military installation even now. The airfield is pretty much surrounded by a wooded area, and Part of the airfield is on a small swamp. When I started working there, I was chided by other military police to be careful of the so-called Dusa Swamp Monster, it was called. We had to have a walking two-man patrol a couple of times a night, walk the perimeter fence inside the field area. There were countless times while on those walking patrols where sounds were heard not only from the swamp area, but also the wooded area along the south perimeter fence. By sound, I mean you could hear branches breaking, not small branches, mind you, but I mean very loud, audible crack. You'd hear dogs barking in the distance and occasionally some kind of animal, which after hearing recordings on the net of a Sasquatch, they sounded awfully familiar. Randomly, I also had to pull a guard at the main gate, which is right there on Route 1, the main entrance to the airfield. I've had the life scared out of me more than I'd like to think about at that gate at night. You're there all by yourself in a small wooden gate shack with one streetlight right above you, and that's it. Anyway, to the south in the woods, I've heard bangs, what you all call knocks, and animal noises. I've seen deer running, like all heck, and jump the fence onto the airfield in the middle of the night to get away from something, and it was one time way too many. When I saw a deer following the fence at about 2 a.m. one night, and I heard something in the wood, I yelled out, and I saw the red reflection of those two eyes staring at me back from the blackness, just inside the trees, just out of range of the streetlights. 
I still see those eyes when I think about it. And it's been over 34 years. One night, about 10 p.m. or around there, I had a civilian motorist come to the gate off Highway 1 and ask me to call the state police. I asked why, and he said, this big, hairy thing, yup, he said, thing, walked across the road in front of him and headed into Fort Belvoir property, and he almost hit it. He thought at first it was a man in a gorilla suit, but it was way too tall to be a man. This guy was shaking like all heck. I told him that it's probably gone now and that the troopers probably would not find it. I had heard of other reports by motorists and even state police about sightings around Route 1 between Dusa and Ford Belvoir. This happened year-round, almost any month of the year. As I said, there had been numerous times, at random times of the evening or night, that I'd heard bangs and branches, which sound more like a whole tree breaking and other strange animal sounds, and there was no way I was going alone out there to see what it was. Other military personnel and military policemen have also heard the sounds coming from the swamp and wooded area, mostly from about sunset to early morning. After sunset, it is dark. No ifs, ands, or buts. I was told by military personnel on the base and other military police that this kind of stuff has been going on since before they were assigned there. It's a pine wooded area, swamp creek. I think there's a housing community on the south side of the wooded area. On to the next one. In Middlesex County in Virginia. The sighting occurred just north of a crest in the road, where you could not see through until you had actually gotten on top of the crest. The road rose again, but not quite as steep as it was going downhill. The sighting took place on the downside of the hill, almost toward the bottom. This incident has been bothering me for 25 years. My girlfriend, now my wife and I, were driving back from Virginia Beach back to Baltimore on Route 17. As I was driving over one hill, I noticed a dead animal on the road. On the slower lane, about half a mile ahead, it appeared to be a large, dead dog. As I approached it, I had to change lanes and started to notice a smell that reminded me of muck we used to pull out of the creek near where I grew up. The odor got stronger, and I thought it was an unusual smell for a dead animal, which now appeared to be the size and color of a German shepherd. As I drove around the animal, I watched it so I would not accidentally hit it as I went by. It straddled the lane markers a bit. I also noticed out of the corner of my eye what I thought was a little old man crouching in the woods behind a leafy branch waiting for me to pass by. The edge of the woods was about 10 yards away, although I can't be sure of the exact distance. My immediate thought was that he was coming out to get his poor dog that got run over. So I curiously watched him in my rearview mirror. What I saw surprised me. Since the car had a loose rearview mirror, I held it as still as I could to see the action. The figure came out of the woods, certainly bigger than I thought it would have been. But what amazed me was that it reached the middle of the road in three strides. It looked down at the dead animal, just as another car was coming over the crest behind me. It stood in a crouch with its hands well below its knees in a sort of monkey-like position. It appeared startled as it jerked its head toward the oncoming car. I saw what looked like two long furry ears, possibly dreadlock-type hair, swinging around, following its head. My first impression was that it looked like one of those old aviator hats with the long ear pieces, but made out of hair. As soon as it was startled by the other car, it turned and took another two and a half steps back into the wood. What amazes me was the length of the stride. My then-girlfriend asked me what was the matter. She said I looked like I saw a ghost. For some reason, I reacted like I just saw something. I couldn't explain and started to get physically shaken. We stopped a few minutes later at a roadside store in Jamaica, Virginia and bought a soda to soothe my nerves. That's when I realized I cannot tell you exactly what I saw but it was definitely not what I originally thought it was. The combination of the rancid odor, the long, quick strides it took, the floppy ears, its color, now makes me wonder if I saw a Sasquatch. Now, in looking at the map, 
I noticed this part of Route 17 goes through a swampy, desolate area. My girlfriend, now my wife, was in the car. At that time, she was oblivious to many things going on around her. That's why I married her. To this day, she says she does not remember the incident. It was just moments before dusk on a clear day with typical hot, sticky weather for Virginia. In August, there was occasional cloud covering the sun and forest on either side for two miles. The highway is divided with a large median between sides. There were no other noticeable landmarks, although my map shows a nearby swamp called Dragon Swamp that parallels the highway. On to the next one. I first encountered something in the spring when camping with a group of friends in the woods bordered by Lines Road to the west of the Florida Turnpike to the east, Sample Road to the south, and Winston Park Development to the north, I left the camp alone at about 1 a.m. heading east toward the turnpike on a trail. I began to hear what seemed to be footsteps in the woods maybe 5 to 10 yards to my right. I'd also like to say that I smelled a musty odor. But I could be inserting that into the report. It's been a while since I've had the encounter, and my recollection isn't as clear as I wish it were. Regardless, I continued to walk, and the footsteps were remaining parallel with mine, and it became clear that whatever was to my right was walking on two feet from the stepping pattern. I started to get a little frightened because the area where the footsteps were coming from was a thicket of Brazilian peppers difficult to walk through during the day, and nearly impossible to manage in the night. I heard it move closer, and I turned around and walked briskly back to camp. I woke my friends, and we went back to find it, although it was gone at that time. I remember leaving with the impression that I had encountered a Sasquatch, which must be because of the scent. Although I wrote it off as a figment of my imagination, that it must have been a farmer or a vagrant in the woods. I proceeded to forget about the incident and never mentioned it again. About six months later, my brother was in the same woods, maybe a half a mile from where I had my encounter, walking at night with a friend. He turned a corner from one trail to another, and Bigfoot was standing at the intersection of two trails. He said it had reached out for him, and he and his friend ran off. He told me about the experience, and I then related mine. We had a running joke for a while that there was a monster in our backyard. I wanted to report the incident for a few reasons. It's a very unusual area to encounter a creature like this. The area is surrounded on all sides by a significant amount of development. While there remained a good deal of open land, including a tomato farm, a tree farm, trade winds park, and some undeveloped land, it didn't strike me as being an area where one would have thought to find a creature like this. There doesn't seem to be too terribly far this thing would go without being spotted. Further, given the amount of development that has gone into the area since, its range is becoming severely limited. Still, it must have found a way to adapt. It is possible it could move along the turnpike and the Sawgrass Expressway somewhat unnoticed, making it over to the nearby landfill as well as Quiet Waters Park although it appears unlikely that it could have gone too much further without being caught in the middle of suburbia. Given the amount of development that has been gone into the area, its range is further being restricted. It might be a very lucrative area to investigate. At that rate, development is going. If it is still back there, it's going to be encroached upon sometime soon. There is a wide array of, of environmental types back there, a good deal of swamp, some pine land, some fields, as well as some farmland. The area I encountered it was in an area of mixed pine with Brazilian peppers on the ground. My brother encouraged it at a trail near some wetlands standing in some brush. On to the next one. I was hunting deer and hogs in Florida on a farm with a lot of underdeveloped land on it. I was walking around a clear cut, heading into the back part of the land, and I smelled something that did not smell right. The smell was, well, as close as I can describe it, 
like a bear that had been sprayed by a skunk. But I have been hunting all my life, and no skunk or bear ever smelled like that. I turned a curve about 40 yards away. I saw an animal that was approximately 6 foot 9 to 7 foot 4. I'm 6 foot 6, and it was taller than I am. Its color was brown. It was on two feet. It turned, and I went to my knees to brace for a shot if it came towards me. It ran faster than any man I have seen run. It ran into the wood. The reason I did not shoot it was it was a possible endangered species or the slim chance it was someone in a suit. I didn't think it was a suit. I've been hunting all my life. I still don't know what it was. P.S. I had a chance to look up on the laws if one was shot but can't find anything. What do you think the repercussions would be? The fish and wildlife say there is no black Florida panther, but if you shoot one, will you go to jail? Have you ever heard a deer grunt call? It made a noise close to that but much deeper in tone. I told my father, and he said he didn't want to know anything. I hear stories from my great uncle and one of his Indian friends about a wild man and a swamp ape running around the creek bed. On to the next one. The following sighting was reported by Mary Beth and Lyle, and here is what the couple had to share. Mary Beth. In late August of 2015, Lyle and I had gone into Acadia National Park for the weekend with our plan being to do some stargazing and some astral photography. Both of us have made a career in academia, and the two of us have been heavily involved in astronomy for as long as we have been together and longer, which amounts to well over 30 years. We had made our camp near the Beehive with our plan being to take the Ocean Path Trail down along the shore at night in order to do our celestial observations and photo shoots. The night was moonless, and the sky was aglow with a billion stars as we began our trek down to the shoreline. I must tell you that just from the light of the stars alone, we could clearly see the beach and waves rolling in from the sea. Both of us are well skilled in the art of observation, and we had stopped at a high point overlooking the shore. In between looking at the sky, I was the first to notice what I believe was a set of tracks going along the beach below us on the fresh wet sand. The tide having retreated from the beach, momentarily Lyle and I decided to abort our sky watch in order to investigate these tracks, if they were in fact tracks at all. Reaching the beach below us, we were standing over not one but two sets of very deep and large tracks which were laid down in line side by side paralleling each other. I put my forearm into one of the tracks nearest the water and there was at least a foot of water in the hole. From the direction of the prints, we could see that whatever had made them came off the rocky area that was behind us and stepped down onto the beach as we had. The pathways meandered to our right, which led up to firmer sand away from the water. As we followed them, we could see very firm and distinct imprints which were sunk perhaps some six inches or so into this portion of the beach. They were those of a large, human-like foot, much like our own, only mammoth in their proportions. The prints traveled away from us for hundreds of yards, heading towards rocky set of short bluffs in the distance. Lyle, what Mary Beth has said thus far is exactly what we observed. It was then that I said to her, don't think that I have gone mad, but these to me are Bigfoot tracks. My wife shook her head in disbelief, but shortly thereafter was in total agreement with my statement. These tracks had only been laid down a short while ago, with the tide having withdrawn from the beach where they had begun, perhaps in the last 50 minutes or so, the reality being that the prints could have been made mere moments before our getting there. Although it was night, there was virtually nothing hidden from view, at least as far as the beach was concerned, and we decided to move forward toward the short bluffs, which were just ahead of us. We saw that the tracks made their own way into the trees, which abutted the beach in a direction, which, if continued, would bring them up into the woods and along the top of the bluff. 
As we approached the wood line, Mary Beth stopped and said, Ooh, what is that? As she pointed her finger before us, sat back within the woods maybe 20 feet, was what appeared to be a pair of glowing red eyes peering out of the trees. As we watched, they were opening and shutting, just like we would blink. And as this pair disappeared from view, perhaps from the animal turning away, another pair was now in view about 20 feet to the left, but slightly lower to the ground. These also were blinking, and from what we could see, the head to which they were attached was turning toward and away from looking at us, and then they disappeared as well. We stood there in total disbelief, concentrating our gaze into the trees in hope of seeing them again and nothing. We began to hear what I will describe as some leaves and twigs crunching, indicating something moving in the woods, which quickly became very faint to our ears. To us, whatever we had been looking at was moving away from the beach, up the hill, and toward these bluffs. Now, these stony bluffs were gray and black rock of some type, which were illuminated under the light of the stars overhead, and the tops of them seemed to offer a slight edge between themselves and where the woods abutted them. As we watched in the hopes of seeing anything further, two huge, dark figures emerged from the trees and were walking along the tops of these stone walls, and they, too, were illuminated in a way where we could now see that they were two Bigfoot. One was trailing the other, and was about a foot shorter in stature, the two of which were only perhaps 200 feet away from us and walking away. We were flabbergasted by the spectacle that was before our very eyes, and then they stopped. The two of them stood facing the water as one of them extended its arm skyward, as if it were pointing toward the stars. I could see their outlines against the brightness of the sky, and then they stepped into the woods and were gone. Mary Beth and I backed away to a position on the beach, where we were in the middle, with a substantial buffer on either side of us, and spent the night watching and listening for any further activity, but nothing else occurred. Neither of us were willing to walk back on the trail, having seen what we had that night. Hours later, when daybreak had come, we hiked back to our camp in total disbelief of what we had seen. It was just incredible. On to the next one. I worked in a nightclub on Miami Beach called Warsaw Ballroom. On Wednesday night, we had a member's night free drinks until 1 a.m. with a show after, which made it busy but early night. After work, I went to a trip to an Everglades National Park City called Flamingo. I was out of work by 3 a.m. It took one hour to get to the gate of the park entrance, which at that time was open and they didn't charge. Me and my friends arrived by 4 a.m. Our plan was to enter the park and go straight across to Flamingo Campout and get up at noon, go on a boat tour, hiking tour, then stop at different Florida habitat, which are on both sides of the road between Florida City and Flamingo on the way back to Miami the next day. When we arrived at the park's entrance, we found ourselves super tired, and as we started across, we decided to stop at the first habitat called Pine Habitat and take a short nap. Well, we arrived in the park and parked relatively close to a dumpster at the habitat, and the temperature was cool but comfortable, so we nodded off, being there was no one in sight, and it was peaceful. About an hour into my nap, I was awakened by my friend, who appeared panicked and was motioning me not to make a sound. My head was on the glass of the driver's side of the sports car we were in. He was shaking and pointing at the glass where my head was touching the window. I didn't lift my head, but I slowly rotated my head around and looked through the glass, which had a metallic limo tint to it, the kind you see out of, but not into, and I saw the head and eye of an ape-like creature trying to look into the car. I got nervous. We had a gun in the car, which I had a permit for. My friend was slowly trying to get it from under the seat, but... I stepped on his hand and motioned, no, don't do that. The ape-like creature was touching the car and continued to try to see in for a good five to ten minutes. 
I had put a reflector plate in that was a lightweight tin foil in the front window as well. It was trying to look in the front window. It walked over to the dumpsters, which was about 15 feet from where we had parked. I noticed a really strange odor, kind of like a skunk, but worse. More rotten smelling. My friend was holding his nose and about to lose it. The creature was nosing through the garbage. Reaching in, it had very long arms and was over six feet tall, covered in a reddish brown blonde fur. Shaggy looking, but very tranquil acting. And because I did not see any breasts, I assumed it was a male. I really couldn't tell. It didn't find anything in the dumpster. It grabbed a McDonald's bag, ripped it apart and threw it, continuing to lightly pull through the dumpster trash for a good half an hour, looking back at the car a few times. Then it darted back towards the car. I didn't want to spook it or make it jump on my car or anything. It started to walk off past the driver's side front of the car through the pines. By this time, it still was not daybreak, but getting close. It continued walking in the northwest direction. We sat there and watched it walk into the swamp. The only camera we had was locked in luggage in the trunk of the car, and my cell phone didn't have a camera. Neither did my friends. We obviously couldn't sleep, so we started up the car and went straight to the other side of Flamingo. When we arrived, we napped in the parking lot of the info center, and when it opened, I went in, found a ranger, and told him what had happened along with a female park ranger as well. They didn't act surprised, and they asked if we had taken pictures. I explained we didn't, and they jokingly said, you didn't shoot it, did you? I said I didn't have a gun, but wouldn't that be illegal to shoot at wildlife? And they said, you'd be surprised how many people do shoot at them. They said thank you for reporting it, but apparently it was a very common thing. They didn't ask for my name or even to write the report down. I never filed anything because my mom said people would think I was crazy, so I never reported it, but it bothered me, so I'm reporting it now. I assure you, I'm quite sane and not a prankster. If you need any additional information, I'm happy to provide it. My best friend at the time and myself reported it to two park ranger employees working in the Flamingo end of the park that next morning, which was Thursday morning. The ranger said it was commonplace and they even seemed to know by my description which creature I was talking about. It was a natural, pristine Florida pine forest. On to the next one. I used to take walks in the afternoon when I would get off of work. There was an old logging road that made a loop about three miles around in the woods across from my house. It was about 3.30 or so when I set off this day. I always carried a little twenty-two pistol with me in case I came across any snakes. My grandmother's two dogs also always went with me on these walks. We had turned off the main grade and gone maybe a quarter of a mile into the woods when we started down through the slough. The logging road cut between two little swamps. There were a lot of scrub oaks and low-growing trees just before it opened up into the swamp. I had just cleared the scrub oak and came into the clearing when I noticed the change. It was like everything in the woods had vanished. The birds stopped singing. I mean, it was quiet. I broke out in a cold sweat, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up like I had just been shot. Like when you know you are being watched. I glanced down at the dogs, and both of them had come to a stop like they were frozen in place. The hair on both of them was standing straight up. They were looking off to the right of me, but neither one of them so much as growled. It may sound funny, but it seemed like on cue the wind picked up, and I caught a smell that I really can't describe. I looked to my right, and about 50 or 60 yards up the hill, I could make out the shape of something very big, standing between a couple of oak trees and some other brush. I stood there for about 30 seconds or so, trying to figure out what it was before it moved. It reached out and grabbed two of the oak trees and started shaking them back and forth. And 
Then I heard something like I have never heard before in my life. It didn't sound like an animal growling or a person screaming, but kind of a mix of both. The next thing I knew, I had reached for my pistol, looked down, and both dogs were gone. I decided that it was time for me to leave at that point, and I made my way very quickly back to the house. The next encounter happened about five days later on the other side of the main grade. I had just left the house from having lunch and going back to work. I was riding a four-wheeler at the time, and we had a lot of trails cut through the woods that we rode on. I had just come out of the woods and onto a pig trail just up from what we called Bathtub Springs. The pig trail turned into a main grade about a quarter of a mile from where I came out on it. I started towards the main grade when I noticed something very large and brown running through the woods about 20 to 25 yards to my left. It kept up with me as I rode about 15 miles per hour for at least 20 seconds. I saw it sling something in a sideways motion like throwing a frisbee. I was just about to the main grade when I realized something had hit me in the chest. I didn't stop until I got out to the main paved road. When I did stop to see what had hit me, I saw that it was a rabbit that had been turned inside out. It was several years before I worked up the courage to go back into those woods. A lot of people may not believe me, but those that know me know that I grew up in those woods, hunting, trapping, fishing, and camping out. I have walked up and been stalked by Florida panthers and wild hogs, but I have never had the feeling of truly being scared until these encounters. The animal observed in the first encounter is estimated to have stood approximately seven and a half feet tall and weighed at least 400 pounds. The trees it shook were 25 to 30 foot tall oak. The sound it made was a very loud wailing-like scream that lasted for what seemed like 15 seconds. The animal observed in the second encounter was light brown to rust-like in colored. It had hands with five fingers. The palm was hairless and dark in color. It ran through the thick woods effortlessly. The time was midday and early afternoon. The weather was sunny. Really beautiful days. It was pine forest that had scrub oak growing among them. There are a lot of fresh water springs in that area. Peacock State Park is directly across from the second encounter. On to the next one. I want to start by saying that I never guessed Bigfoot to be real. I regret to admit that I was one of those people who would have probably got into a heated debate if I was around someone who was saying that the creature exists. Well, that would all change when I was on my friend's yacht along the coast of Vancouver Island only three years ago. One of my girlfriends had an extremely wealthy friend from China who owns real estate in Canada. On a long weekend, I was invited to join them along with a group of somewhere around 10 others to head out on a little cruise. The whole thing was wild. Although I did have a bit of trouble communicating with our host since he spoke relatively little English. He tried pretty hard, but I did even have trouble understanding much of the English he did know. That made things a little bit awkward, but everyone was intoxicated for the most part, so we were all pretty laid back. That is, until we saw this large creature it was in the evening that we were anchored near what I suppose you'd call a small island just outside the main island. The small island was covered with very large pine trees and you couldn't see a whole lot past the thin coastline. One of the girls was talking about how she saw a couple of weird people come out of the water and walk into the forest. The reason she kept talking about it was that she said their movements were very odd. I remember her saying it reminded her a lot of the character Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Of course, many of the other girls were making fun of her, saying things like how she must have smoked too much weed or drank too much. By the way, it's always annoyed me when people comment that you must have been drinking too much when you see things that are hard for them to comprehend. Last time I checked, alcohol isn't at all like mushrooms, acid, or other psychedelics. 
But it was when someone mentioned the word Bigfoot that the real joke started to come in. However, all of that laughter would stop once the Chinese man ran over to the railing in his robe, pointing toward the coastline of the small island. He was so excited that it was causing him to speak in his own language. I'm not sure he even realized for those few seconds that he was doing that. Either way, many of the girls rushed over to where he was standing and quickly checked out the scene. I remember hearing several gasps, all caught sight of the large, hairy animal swimming towards the yacht. Girls even started screaming as the thing was nearing the large boat at an alarmingly high speed. It would often fully submerge itself for around what I guess to be about five seconds, and then it would reappear at the surface much closer than it was before it went underwater. Every time the creature's head popped up above the surface, all of the girls on the yacht would hysterically scream again. Eventually, it reached us and attempted to start to climb up the side. It quickly grew frustrated once it realized the walls were too slippery and there was nothing for it to grip to make its way up to us. I remember the Chinese man and a few of the girls had their phones out and were recording the animal as it continued to try to get to us. I'm even certain that one of the girls posted the video on YouTube and other forms of social media, but it was quickly taken down by moderators. For whatever reason, it was obvious that someone didn't want this footage spreading. I don't remember hearing any kind of noise coming from the creature. There was nothing but splashing. Within what felt like a few minutes, we all watched as the creature again went underwater and didn't come up for a few minutes. The Chinese man suddenly got very worried and ran toward the back of the yacht. I think he was worried that he left the ladder lowered into the water or something. But luckily, when he got over there, he realized that wasn't the case. But his hunch was correct. The creature was near the back of the boat, more than likely assuming that's where its best chance of finding its way up was. It wasn't long after that that the creature started to get exhausted and began to swim back toward the shore of the small island. It was once it got out of the water and shook off that it screamed into the air. When I look back on it, I think the creature was acting territorial and was doing anything it could think of to convince us to head away from that small island. Maybe the creature on that small island had had violent confrontations with other humans in the past. Who knows? All I know is that I would have peed my pants if I had been on foot and had seen one of those things. There's no question that something like that would be able to do whatever it wanted to someone of my size. I'd be willing to bet money that many of the people who go missing in the woods ended up running into these creatures. It just makes too much sense to disregard that theory. One thing I will never do is hike throughout Vancouver Island. I just have this feeling that those creatures are all over the place in that wilderness. I don't think you could pay me enough money to camp in a place like that. On to the next one. My encounter took place while I was on a camping trip with my girlfriend in the middle of Texas. It was in the autumn season because my girlfriend had gotten really into camping and wanted to do it while the leaves were most colorful. I remember hesitating a bit because my girlfriend was the type to get cold easily, and I knew it got colder than normal at night in October. The convenient part about it was that we had no trouble booking a popular campground, as compared to summer, it was considered off-season. It happened during a long weekend, and it wasn't until the third night of our stay that we experienced the phenomenon. I remember we were cooking up some BLT sandwiches over the campfire, when suddenly there was a huge crashing sound coming out of the woods. It was so explosive and startling that I can feel my heartbeat accelerating as I think about it right now. Out of the woods came what looked to me like a very large naked man. He didn't just look like a human because he was completely covered in hair, but the hair was much thinner than that of any animal I've ever seen or even what I would expect a Sasquatch to have. I thought the face resembled that of a caveman or Neanderthal. 
It ran on all fours over to the fire. It looked like it had expected to have a much easier time removing the bacon from the foil that sat atop the fire ring. The animal was missing teeth on both rows, and it didn't have anything that I would consider to be sharp like canines. The teeth were much like ours, only much, much larger. It seemed to start looking around the ground for a stick or twig that it could use to remove the bacon from the foil without burning its fingers. I got the sense that these things were terrified of fire, but that this one was desperately hungry. Clearly, it had a craving for meat, so I immediately wondered if the deer populations in the area were scarce. My girlfriend, who I should probably mention is now my wife, ran to the car, only to realize it was locked. She then ran around to the side of the vehicle as there was no other place to escape to. I didn't even know what to do, but I did know that the keys to the car were inside our tent, and to get to the tent, I would have to get closer to our visitor. Even though this thing could have polarized me with one blow, it seemed much more interested in the bacon than my girlfriend or I. It wasn't all that long before it did manage to get the desired meat, and I remember how it made weird noises due to the high heat of the food. But that goes to show how hungry it truly was. From there, all it did was look around the area for a few more seconds before it walked back into the woods on all fours. We quickly threw everything in the car and screamed. Neither of us had the desire to go camping ever since. On to the next one. It was November of 1982, and I was 15 years old. I come from a hunting and fishing family and started to enjoy the great outdoors from a very young age. I harvested my first deer at 10 years of age. My father was a decorated World War II Navy veteran. He was actually on the U.S. Yorktown and in charge of the engine room at the Battle of Midway. He retired as a Master Chief. Just to give you a little background about why I was raised to fear almost nothing. I think this also helps me to explain why I could never share this encounter with anyone including my six older siblings. I was the youngest of seven. It was a brisk November day. My father and I were out deer hunting in what was then the U.S. Army Jefferson Proving Grounds. It is now known as Big Oaks Wildlife Preserve. My father and I had agreed upon ground stands and large trees that we would lean back against, which were big enough if that a stray shotgun slug happened to come your direction, the tree would stop it. I had sat at my tree since 5 a.m. At around 11 a.m., I ate the lunch that my mom had packed for me. It was a sunny day, and it had warmed up to probably the lower 50s. Like any teenager with a full stomach, I fell asleep. I am not sure how much time had passed but I was awoken by rustling footsteps in the dry oak leaves behind me, thinking it was my dad coming to check on me. I leaned around the tree and froze. Not 30 feet from me stood an ape-like creature on two legs. It had hair that I can only describe as being the color of ripe wheat. It stood approximately nine and a half to ten feet tall. Its face was flat and was connected to what I guess you would describe as a high forehead. I did not get a great look at its eyes, but they seemed dark. I would guess its weight to have been somewhere between 400 and 450 pounds. I think it smelled the deer urine I had put down that morning, but with the weather warming up, the wind direction had changed. Thank God, because I knew in my heart that if it would have seen me, my family would have never seen me again. I eased back around my tree and began to shake. I knew that the three 12-gauge slugs in my gun would do nothing to something that muscular. 
other than to simply piss it off. In a few minutes, its footsteps gradually drifted out of earshot, and I went to find my dad. I faked a stomach ache so that we could go home. Years afterward, I remember that every year we would have to go to a safety briefing before the hunt, and the colonel would always tell us, no cameras, and if you don't know what it is, don't shoot at it. Before, he would add, you don't want to know what's in here. I have never told another living soul this story. Even after all these years, I'm still shaking as I think back on it. On to the next story. The area in which these encounters took place is in the Center Star community of Lauderdale County, Alabama. There are a mix of new subdivisions, farms, trailers, and old homes. It is very thickly wooded with plenty of deer, fox, turkey, livestock, and other wildlife. The entire area runs along the Tennessee River, with several large creeks branching off the river. The Blue Water Creek runs off the river inland, and in some parts there are high cliffs and caves. The main areas of focus for my recount are bordered by County Roads 33, 31, 411, and 111. There are plenty of areas where the woods get so thick that you cannot gain access to them. As a side note, there have also been some very large deer, 14 point, killed here. I will describe each incident in detail. Incident 1 March 2011, about 7 a.m. It was the first morning of daylight savings. The clocks had been moved forward and I was out delivering papers. As I was making a delivery on Route 33, I noticed a large herd of deer running across the road about a hundred yards in front of me. I would see deer every night, so that wasn't out of the ordinary. But what caught my attention was that they were being chased. They crossed from the woods to the south into the thicker woods to the north. I pulled up and looked at the place where they had come out of the woods. I was searching for what had been chasing them, but the only thing I noticed was it was very still and quiet for that time of the morning, and the trees were shaking. I also noticed that some of the cows in a nearby field were acting funny. They seemed very nervous. I grew up around cattle, so... I can tell when they are out of sort. The next morning, at around 5 a.m., I was on the backside of the woods where the previous incident took place. This time, I was on Road 411. This is a dirt road going down to the sailing club. It is very thickly wooded to the north and to the south. Are some weekend homes and the club. I only needed to deliver one paper turn around, and drive back out. Although there is one street light at the end of the road, on the whole, the street is still very dark. I had stopped to use the bathroom. I was facing the woods as I was doing so, and all of a sudden, something growled and screamed from the woods at me. It was close enough that it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It was probably within 20 yards of me. I came back to investigate in the daylight and drove through the area slowly, but I didn't see or hear anything. I also did some research on bobcat calls, as that was the only thing I thought it could possibly be. But this was no bobcat call. Several nights later, I was in the same area when suddenly... About 200 yards in front of me, I saw some eye shine coming from the riverside of the road before crossing into the wood. The shine was about six feet high. I did see that the farm bordering this road had a large horse, and I knew that she had gotten out a few times, but she was nowhere near six feet off the ground. 
I began riding through the area with a video camera. A few days later, I saw the farm owner and asked if she knew whether her horse had gotten out. She said she had not, but that her father-in-law said that was probably what had trampled all over the garden. This whole area is very well suited to a Bigfoot. I call the woods the Bigfoot Woods. They just have a creepy feel to them. I began to check the area several times a day, but never saw anything. A few weeks later, the landowner moved some cattle in, but they did not stay long. I left a note on the fence asking if I could hike in the area, but I never heard from him. A few months later, we moved into a newer neighborhood about a mile away from our old property. This new neighborhood was on the river, so I was able to observe the area at several times of the day and night. Incident number three. Late August, around 3 a.m., this encounter occurred roughly two miles from the first incident, along Road 111, closer to Blue Water Creek. The area is an isolated road with thick woods to both sides. There are farms on either side as well. It was a very muggy night, and I had my windows down and my tops out of the car. I was making a delivery, and the area across the road from me sloped up slightly into some thick woods between two farms. The woods went all the way back to the creek and river inlet. I had just made my delivery when I heard a sound that to this day is still the scariest thing I have ever heard. From across the road came this combination of a bark mixed with an owl hoot followed by monkey chatter. It sounded like it was right inside the forest, not far from the tree line, and judging by the array of noises I was hearing, I guessed that there were more than one of them. I left as quickly as I could. If something had come out of the slope, it would have been right on top of me. I didn't see it, but I felt its presence in the shadows, just beyond the tree line. I never took my tops out again on that road, and I kept my windows up unless I was delivering. The next few nights, I did slow down and listen as I drove through. I also began to patrol that area at several different times throughout the day. I noticed that the area had a small ditch running down the middle of it. I never found out who owned the land to explore it more. However, I did download some Bigfoot calls and screams on my phone while I was making deliveries or at various times, especially during dawn or dusk. I would ride through playing those calls. I never got a response. There were several times I thought I heard hoots and calls. We had a lot of foxes in the area, but I know they did not get loud. I heard these emanating from somewhere in the darkness. Often, while I was outside at night, I would hear scream coming from the area of my first sighting. My new home was about a mile to the east of that area. I would also jog and run through that area, but never saw anything else again. I know that Lauderdale County has had a few sightings. I was directly across the river from Colbert County, where they had some activity around 2000. Wayne County, Tennessee. This was around 1995 to 1996, in an area of the county about 10 miles inside Tennessee. This county has a lot of deep forest and timber, which enabled them to supply the paper mill in Cortland with wood. I had been given permission to hunt a very deep area of the woods by the landowner. He said he never went all the way out there and that I could have at it. I began to prepare for deer season by doing some midday and late afternoon glassing. It was almost the perfect area to hunt. Three miles off the main road, quiet and without any other activity for miles. The land next door was a huge cotton and soybean field, but looked like the back 40 belonging to the landowner. Incident 1. 
early September, around 5 a.m. on a Saturday, I decided to go to the location before sunset to set up. I found a spot overlooking the area I was planning to hunt, which enabled me to just sit, wait, and watch to see what came through. I had a 78 Chevy Blazer, so I was able to drive about half a mile from the location. I decided to walk the rest of the way to cut down on the noise. I got there at about 4 a.m. and decided to sit and wait for a few minutes. I cracked my window a bit and noticed it was very eerily still. There was no noise at all. After a few minutes, I got out to use the bathroom and noticed it was just way too quiet. I got the willies, so to speak. A few minutes later, something hit the hood of my blazer. I thought it was just an acorn. A couple of minutes later, a hand-sized rock hit the hood. I had my gun with me, so I loaded it and waited. Nothing else happened, but I decided to leave anyway. I came back that afternoon with my father, but did not tell him what had happened earlier that morning. We walked around, and he noticed a tree was down. I remarked that I had been in the area last week and hadn't seen it. It looked as though it had been pushed over. We stayed about an hour and didn't see or hear anything. He was looking for deer signs, but I was looking for both signs of the deer and for something else. Incident 2 about a week later, late afternoon at about 4.30, I was back in the area to do some late afternoon scouting and could see no sign of deer at all. I even sat in a very secluded area and did some rattling, but still there was nothing. I walked the perimeter which ran along next to the neighboring land. The area I was in intersected with the cotton field and the start of a very thickly growth of forest used by the paper mill. As I was approaching a very dense part of the forest, something huge broke out of the area, but I could not see it as it moved so fast. But it was gone in a flash. Whatever it was, it was huge. I have flushed deer before, and this noise was so loud, it sounded like ten deer. I kept waiting to see it break out of the woodline and burst into the field, but it stayed just within the perimeter of the trees. It was making a racket, and I could see trees swaying. I also noticed a kind of musty basement smell. I hunted the land when the season started, but never saw or heard any sign of deer. I honestly think the area had been used so little that it had become nothing more than a rest stop for Bigfoot. Maybe I had disturbed them. I went to the landowner and thanked him, but told him I had found another area closer to where I lived. He said, yeah, nobody has really had any luck back there, but I don't know why. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!